Greetings to all of you in the name of Jesus. And good morning. Good morning. Blessings to you. It's good to see your faces, smiling faces. I have something again for any of the children that want to sit up front today. So if you want something, you're welcome to sit up front. And let me light this candle before I get started. I can do it here. There we go. And that that was, a, well, I'll just say it right now. Uh, this morning, I got awake at about 3.08, and I laid in bed for probably an hour and a half, just songs and, and verses and prayers going through my mind. And one of the things that was in my mind's eye was this, just that right there, just that flame of candle. And uh, I don't know for sure what it was supposed to mean, but I thought, thought of the verses in Isaiah. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen up upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Each one of us carries a flame, as followers of Jesus, carries a flame inside of us. And that flame draws people to us as followers of Jesus. Nobody else is going to come up and join Courtney? Anybody else want to join Courtney? <laughs> you hear the rustling of the bag, don't you? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Bribing you to sit up front. You. you are welcome. Whoops, dropped one. Everybody's coming up. Blessings on you. I love you, children. I always enjoy when you sit up front. It makes me, it makes me uh, somebody else was heading up this way. Who was it? Shall I pitch you one? See if I can get you back there. <laughs> I got Michaela. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Who else wants one? I got a bunch of them today. There's a couple. There's a few more. <laughs> I'm allowed to do this in church. <laughs> I don't have enough for quite everybody. You guys want some, I'm sure. That, you got three of them there. I have a few more left. See me after church if you, if you want one. But anyways, I was talking about what happened during the night and uh, just thinking about the whole sermon today and sharing about the birth of Jesus. You know, the word Christmas, I'll just be frank with you, kind of carries a negative connotation when I hear the word Christmas or celebrating Christmas because of, of the commercialization and all of the negative things all, that happen uh, after Christmas, right? So there's so much excitement and, and things that take place leading up to Christmas and the New Year, and then at the end of the, you know the stats, at the end of, end of it, it's like, ha, huh, i got to go back to work, got to go back. That is not the birth of Jesus. When Jesus is alive inside of you, and that flame is burning inside of you, it doesn't matter whether it's December 25th, January the 1st, or January the 2nd, because that life is inside of you and keeps burning. And so... Um, but the birth of Jesus, and by the way, I, I want to speak into the, the theme for today. I'll be speaking about an aspect of the birth of Jesus. And I want to try to stay within my 30-minute window if I can. Uh, and so if I go too long, just start waving your hands. Time to sit down. But uh, anyways, um, and when Joe mentioned that to me, I was ready to preach on Monday. I don't know which day he, for sure, wh which day he mentioned it to me, but it's one of the most exciting stories that ever happened. The birth of Jesus and everything that it entails uh, on, the, on, on God's favor on us poor, broken people. 
By the way, I have a note here. I wanted to make a correction. The last time I spoke, this is completely, totally not related to the sermon today, but I was talking to you, if you remember, about the gates of hell and how that Jehoshaphat raised up a uh, altar in the north of Israel so that the Israelites that were in that area could come there to worship at this uh, uh, altar of idolatry. But it was not Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is one of my favorite Old Testament characters, but he was a revivalist in the Old Testament. It was uh, Jeroboam was the one that did that. He was a wicked king. And so I just wanted to correct that in case you noticed that. I didn't even think about it until later. I think my wife mentioned it to me, so I wanted to make that correction. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention before I get into a scripture here is... Um, in the spring when we were in Israel, we went to, to uh, maybe I should just map it for you. These places are a lot more, more uh, clear in my mind. Um, Israel would be here, kind of this strip of land. Down in this section somewhere is, is Palestine. You've all heard about Palestine. And Bethlehem is actually in Palestine. I don't know if you knew that or not, but we had to go through a security gate leaving the, leaving the, the, leaving, not leaving Israel, but leaving the, what would you call it? I don't know what you would call the difference between uh, where the people of Israel are today into Palestine. There's a security gate, and that's where a lot of the um, Islamic people are, Muslims and so on. But Bethlehem is in Palestine. Jerusalem would be maybe somewhere up in here, and then Nazareth is, I want to say, something like that. I'm not quite sure if I have it quite right. But those two places are very significant in the story for today. And so we went to, went to Palestine, went through the gate into Palestine, and uh, we sat there at the shepherd's field, called the shepherd's field, just outside of, outside of Bethlehem, up on the hill. It's very, uh, there's, it's, is a very uh, there's hills most of, of of the cities are on hills Bethlehem is that way today it's built on a hill we went went back towards the to the side of the hill and more like a ridge what we would call a ridge and there was the shepherd's field and there was a place where we we could set up the sound system and we had a concert there looking out over the rocky uh, terrain and the valley there, and down in the valley there was a shepherd was uh, shepherding or herding his goats or sheep or whatever. And uh, sitting there and realizing that this is exactly the place where Jesus showed up when he was born, somewhere in this area. Or also right around that area where we were, was there's very rocky, and we could go down some steps into like a rock cave, and uh, very likely, that could have been a place where Jesus was born, something like that. But the song I wanted to comment on was, the Stutzmans were singing this song. And they were singing this song that talks about Jesus. And I know now who he is. When Jesus was born, people, with the exception of a few, we're trying to understand who is this Jesus. We have the advantage today of living on this side of the story where it's been fulfilled and we can look back and we say, oh yeah, it's very clear. I, we can see, we can connect all of the dots. We know who Jesus was and who he is. In that day, it was very hard to understand. You had the prophecies and you had people saying, this is the Messiah. No, it's not the Messiah. He would be like this. No, he would be like that. And they were trying to understand who he is. And he just really settled home to me. I know now who Jesus is. And if you have a connection with Jesus, in your spirit, on the heart level, you, your heart resonates with that, with those words. Because you know who Jesus is. There's no question in our minds who Jesus is. Because we know him. We now know who he is. And I uh, just wanted to mention that, thinking back of us sitting there and singing those songs, and it was very meaningful, uh, very meaningful to me. 
Today I want to speak out of the, the title, God's Life is Burst Through Difficulty. And I want to read in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Remember I mentioned Nazareth up here to the north or northwest of Jerusalem? To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was, what, do you, what was the virgin's name front bench? Who was Jesus' mother? Yes. Mary. Mary was her name, just like my wife. And I'd say this Mary and my wife were probably very similar in character, I would say. Anyways, and the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and he shall be the son of the highest. And the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. It's not hard to understand why they thought this is going to be a literal earthly kingdom, isn't it? After words like that. And Mary, the virgin, said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man, or I'm not married? How can I give birth or become pregnant since I'm not married, or I don't, I didn't have a relationship with a man. And the angel said unto, the, unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called what? The Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she also hath conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. That simply means that a virgin can conceive and bring forth a child. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. I would would love to have a conversation with Mary about this experience because there is many, many details that are not given here that you know had to have happened. And... I would think that there was some time that elapsed from the time the angel met her and said, this is your assignment, this is your destiny, till Mary said, be it unto me according to thy word. Because this was a massive, massive thing. Here was a woman, a young girl, that was betrothed or engaged to be married. And you can imagine all of the scenarios that ran through her mind as she thought about this. I'm, begu- I'm going to become pregnant. And I'm engaged to be married. And she thought of what happens to people like that. People like that were supposed to be stoned in the Old Testament. If they, if they engaged in, in uh, sexual relationships under certain conditions outside of marriage, they were to be stoned and put to death. And so I feel certain that she thought of all of these things. She thought about Joseph, her husband-to-be. What's he going to think when he finds out I am pregnant? What are my mom and dad going to say when they find out that I am pregnant? What are my... What are the Pharisees? What are the what? Is, what is the temple? What are the what are the people? What are the what are the people in my community going to say when they find out that I'm pregnant? Because 
you can only get pregnant one way, we think. I would propose to you that all of you, and I've said this, I may have said this here before, next time somebody asks you, especially if you're a man, they ask you how you are, tell them, I am pregnant. Because you're carrying the life of, the, of God inside of you. Every one of us are pregnant as followers of Jesus again. We are pregnant with God's life. God's life is being formed in us for a birth that, is, that He wants to take place through our humanity. God, one of the prayers that, I've, that I was praying before this morning or last night or sometime, God, impact my humanity with your divinity. That is the pregnancy of the Holy Spirit inside of us. Whether we are male or female, it doesn't matter. We carry God's life inside of us. Anyway, so as Mary was thinking about all of these things, and then she said to the, to the angel Gabriel, Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel left. What kind of character did Mary have that allowed her to make that decision? Because the testimony of her is that you're highly favored. God was looking for a place that he could safely place his life inside of a human body, a human being. And he was watching and he was looking. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for those whose hearts are perfect toward him. Apparently, Mary was one of those people. And God saw her and he realized Mary has character. Her character is strong enough. I can trust her to place my life inside of her. I can trust her to give birth to the Son of God. Jesus the Christ. And so the angel Gabriel was sent with a message from God from heaven to her. And, you, and it basically said, you have been chosen for this assignment. And she said, I am willing. That's the sermon in a nutshell today. Am I willing to become that kind of a servant. This servant, Mary, this, this uh, servant girl, Mary, was willing to walk this path of shame and rejection. She was willing to say, I am pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Now, I can pretty much guarantee you that if some girl would show up in our community today and said, I am pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit, we would all say, you've lost your mind. That doesn't happen. And this was how it was back then. Even though, and there was probably a few, I don't know if Mary knew the passage in Isaiah ch chapter 7 or not, a virgin shall conceive. God spoke these words thousands of years ago, thousands, maybe not thousands, it was, it was at least 400 plus years ago. Through Isaiah, he said, this is the sign. A virgin, a woman that has no sexual relationship shall become pregnant with the Son of God. His name shall be called Emmanuel. And this is what was now ful being fulfilled through Mary uh, in, in her life. And maybe if you would have read that verse, you said, well, you know, maybe it is possible. But it's not possible scientifically. It's not possible. Supernaturally, yes. But that's what happened. And so she said, Be it unto me according to thy word. That verse is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. That passage, I think of it many, many times. Lord, behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed. God's plan, to the, God had a plan to display his love and goodness to lost humanity. This plan started all the way before the beginning of time. This, these, these statements in the Bible boggle my mind. I don't understand that. Sometime before time, sometime before time, there was a place where there was a conversation. And there was a plan that was hatched or formed by God and Jesus. And they looked into the future and they saw you and I. They saw all of the things that happened before it happened. 
And they saw everything that was going to happen from what we know as creation to the end of what we call the end of the age. He, God sees and knows everything that will happen. And so they put this plan in motion. And this plan was to display who God is through Jesus, through the God-man, through Jesus the Christ. Jesus was the human part. Christ was the anointed Son. For unto us a child, Jesus, is born. Unto us a Son, the anointed Christ, is given. Jesus was born. Christ was given. The two came together into a testimony and a display of who God is, and also for the purpose of redeeming us, our lostness, and our brokenness. So God had it planned before the foundation of the world. And just um, in Revelations, just to, just to uh, confirm this, Revelations uh, chapter 13, verse 8, there's a phrase given here in this verse, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, who's talking about the beast, and then whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain when before the foundation of the world. The other thing about this story is nothing made sense. The prophecy was Jesus is going to be born where? Where was Jesus supposed to be born? Front bench. Any ideas? Yes. Bethlehem. Jesus was prophesied to be born in Bethlehem. And where was Mary from? Anybody in the audience? Where did Gabriel meet Mary? Nazareth. So Jesus was born, is going to be born in Bethlehem. Mary was living 90 miles north, and that's a long ways if you have to walk, right? You walk all the way to Pittsburgh. How many of you have walked to Pittsburgh lately? We don't do that. It's a long ways. So she was living in Nazareth. The angel came to her and said, you're going to be pregnant with the Son of God. And you would think, well, she's in Nazareth. How can he be born in Bethlehem? And then the Bible tells us that we're ha this is a riddle, by the way. Uh, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And then all the way over here, down here somewhere, is Egypt. Out of Egypt have I called my son. Who was that? Jesus. The prophecy was, Jesus is going to be called out of Egypt. No, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Mary's living in Nazareth. He's going to be called out of Egypt. How can this all this be? And the Bible says, also says, he shall be called a Nazarene. So if he's a Nazarene, well, he must come from Nazareth. And you're sitting there and you're like, I don't know, this doesn't make any sense. Have you ever felt that way about your life? Nothing makes any sense whatsoever. Well, God has a plan, right? If you have said, Lord, be it unto me according to your word, God has a plan. But nothing makes sense. Yes? Anybody experience that? Can you be honest this morning? If you've walked with God any length of time, you know this to be true. Things do not make sense, but God has a plan. And so we can always come back and, and, believe, and rest our faith there. God has a plan for our lives. Now I want to ask you a couple of questions. Was Jesus called a Nazarene? Yes. Was he born in Bethlehem? Yes, we know that. Was he called out of Egypt? Yes. So all of those promises came true. But as God was speaking these prophetic words into the future, it didn't make any sense. But God had a plan. And by the way, that is, that is the principle that God works with even today. He, he has a plan, and many times it does not make sense to us. The point is, our posture should be the posture of Mary. Behold, the handmaid or the servant of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And you do the next thing in faithfulness 
to God. Do you, how many of you believe that Mary was a faithful woman? She, if she would not have been faithful in doing the next thing that was in front of her nose, God would not have chosen her to give birth to the Son of God. I do not believe that he would have. She, was, she had developed a character of faithfulness. And God saw her character and he knew that she was the person that would be able to endure through this birth of the Son of God. God was looking, God is still looking, for a safe place to grow his life. He needed a human body that he could trust with growing his life. The Savior from sin, the perfect lamb for sacrifice. God was, was, was forming a lamb of sacrifice, the perfect lamb of sacrifice. He needed a safe place to do this. God also today needs a place, a safe place to put his Holy Spirit into so that he can grow that purpose. He can grow your destiny out of that purpose. And so what is our posture supposed to, supposed to be? Tell me somebody from the audience. Very simple. Yes, be it unto me according to thy word. And I want you to plant, I want God to plant that deep into your hearts today. Most times, the way God gives birth to his life in human form is not how we would expect. We say, Lord, send revival. We want personal revival into our lives. And then the next thing that happens is we have all kinds of problems in our lives. All kinds of trouble comes our way. And God says, well, you ask for it. And we say, God, this doesn't make sense. I don't want that. I want this. And God is saying, no, I'm answering your prayer. I'm answering your prayer. Now, we should be praying those prayers, but many times it doesn't look the way we would expect. What Would we believe a young virgin that says, I'm pregnant with the Holy Spirit? We would not pick that as a way to give birth to God's life on the planet. Us humans, we would not do that because we would look at all of the negativity. You know, and this, this negativity followed Mary for a long time. Because the, the, the Pharisees, when there was conflict between them and Jesus, I can't remember what the context was, but they said, we're not born like a fornication like you are. So you know that it was in their mind all this time. They still believed that Jesus was conceived in fornication. Mary knew it, he wasn't. Elizabeth, her cousin, knew that he wasn't. There was a few people that knew who Jesus was, and they were very few. But they were, there was a few. And Joseph had the dream. He knew that him and Mary did not have sexual relationships and that she became pregnant by the Holy Ghost. So there was three people at least, Mary, Joseph, and Elizabeth. And I don't know if there was more than that, but there was those three. And so they knew, but they carried the stigma. She carried the stigma of having become pregnant through fornication. And I don't know whether she was ever vindicated. I think possibly if she was still around after the Holy Spirit was given, that maybe there was some vindication. But many times, and there's no guarantee, when we follow God's path for our life, there's a chance that we'll be misunderstood, there's a chance we'll be rejected, and there's a chance that we'll be walking a pathway of shame. Jesus walked that path as well, didn't he? He carried the anointing, anointed mantle of being the Christ, but he was rejected. He was despised. He was def afflicted. And in the end, he hung on that cross and died. But there was a resurrection. And I could just jump around. I was sitting back. This whole thing makes me jumpy. I was, I was visualizing myself up here jumping around and dancing because this is so powerful. It is so inspiring to see these principles, this truth, this amazing truth. No wonder, and I don't, the angels didn't even understand what was going on, but this, the, the, the angel came and announced it to the shepherds, and then there was a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill to men. When the filling of the Holy Spirit, I'll just have to say this, in case you think I am off my rocker, 
that we get emotional and excited when God's truth gets inside of us. Elizabeth, when she met Mary six months into her pregnancy, what happened? The baby jumped around inside of her and she became filled with the Holy Spirit and started speaking words of inspiration. Read those words. They're amazing words. When the Holy Spirit comes inside of a person, there are changes that take place. There are things that happen. Christianity is a religion of life, power. We were reading in our Sunday school lesson, we're made sons of God. We, have, we are filled with power and anointing and the Holy Spirit. And so this is what happened. But the pathway of rejection and shame and misunderstanding. How many of you are willing to walk that path? Am I willing to walk that path? Because many times, even today yet, when you follow Jesus, Lord, be it unto me. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. There is a pathway of shame and rejection that follows. Are you willing? Am I willing? And I thought a lot about this yesterday. Am I willing to walk that pathway? Or will I say the cost is too great? I can't do it. What are people going to say? What are people going to think about me? What will people say and think about me? Do you care more about that? Or do you care more about how can I bring glory and honor to God? Was Mary pregnant from the Holy Spirit? Yes. We now know it's true. And we admire her for her courage to walk this path of rejection and shame. It basically takes agreement with God for His plan for my life. God has a plan for each of us to host the Holy Spirit, His holy presence, and to grow His life in us. Everything that happens in the life of a person that says, say it with me, be it unto me according to thy word. If that is truly the posture of your heart, every circumstance, everything that happens after that is designed for one purpose, to put you to death and to give birth to God's life. It's the principle Jesus said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, there's a resurrection. Didn't say it quite that way, but that's the truth. When that seed finally is willing to say, be it unto me according to thy word, there's a shoot of life that comes out. Hallelujah. Love the picture. That's the principle. It's the principle that we live by as followers of Jesus. So once again, will you agree with God's plan for your life? Or does God have to agree with your plan for your life? Which is it? Which will it be? Paul said, this is why Paul, Paul understood this principle. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in macho. No, <laughs> my strength is made perfect in weakness. And what did Paul say? Thank you, Lord, for my weakness. Thank you for my trials. Thank you for all of the difficulties that are coming my way because I know when I am weak, then I am strong. Or he could have said, then God's strength is developed and perfected in me. That's why James said, take joyfully the spoiling of your goods. That's what that's all about. And I'll just have to confess, I don't know that I'm quite there yet. There's a level of it. I understand it better than I used to, and I think I'm more compliant with God than I used to. But still, when difficulty comes or hard times come, I'm like, 
Let's get rid of this. Let's just have it be nice and happy and peaceful, right? That's our humanity must be put to death. There are also times, there are actually times when God wants to deliver us from our difficulty. It's not wrong to ask Him if we're having a hard time, a difficulty in our lives. It's not wrong to pray and ask God, could you please take this from me? Paul did that. He did it three times and God said, no, you have to live with this. And I might, I'll give you grace for it. There are times when God wants to take us through difficulty. Do you think there were times in Mary's life when she thought about her situation? Like, oh, I just, you know, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to go through this? I would say probably so. She was a human just like you and I. And she felt the pain and the sorrow and the grief. And you know, there was a word given her by Zechariah, I think, Zechariah. He said, he was blessing her. And then he uh, said, there's a sword that's going to pierce your heart. And as, as Mary stood there at the cross, the mother of Jesus stood there at the cross, and she had... You know, at times it looked like Jesus. This, this has to be the Son of God. Anytime soon, he's going to release his kingdom and take over the country and the Romans, chase the Romans out and all of that. There are times when I'm sure they thought that. But as she stood there by the cross and she remembered all of the things that it took place, she remembered what Gabriel said, all the prophetic words, and she saw them put the spear into his side and blood and water ran out. Can you imagine what she felt? That sword pierced her heart as well. But there was a resurrection. You know, what, you could say, well, why are you preaching something like this at Christmas? But I'll tell you, this is really what it's about. This is really what the birth of Jesus is about. It is God developing his life through pain and difficulty. What was harder for Jesus to go through than to hear or to look into his father's face and realize that his father had forsaken him? And he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he gave up the ghost and died. But he came back to life and there was a resurrection. And so for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He went through the pain, he went through the suffering, the shame and the rejection because he knew and we also know if we walk the path that God has for us, the path of shame and rejection, sorrow, brokenness, whatever, that there will be a resurrection. So be encouraged. Be encouraged by that. There's also another reason for difficulty. We're talking about giving birth and it's time for me to close I want to leave this with you giving birth to God's life through difficulty when difficulty comes into your life there's a good possibility that it is meant to uncover the things that are hiding in the closet that are keeping you from becoming a birth giver of God's life that process is very common in our lives as Christians so look at it as a positive. If there's hard things that come to your way, God is customizing the difficulties in your life. He knows exactly what it takes to uncover you, to, sh to, to reveal what's hiding under the surface. How many of you have things that are hiding in the closet? We probably all do, and we may not even know that they're there. So God lets, puts us on the potter's wheel and starts stretching and forming us. And we're crying and saying, God, I want to get off of here. No, you said, be it unto me according to your word. Don't argue with me. Am I being faithful to God in all of my life? Will I agree with his plan? Will I say with Mary, the mother of Jesus, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, and I do not believe that she said this lightly, be it unto me according to your word. And she stepped through that doorway onto that path of shame, rejection, misunderstanding because she was carrying the anointed Christ in her womb that was put there by the Holy Spirit. Will you and I walk that path? 
is a challenge. It's a joyful message, but it's a sorrowful message depending on your focus and depending how you understand it. Behold, I bring you great tidings of, bring you good tidings of great joy. A sword shall also pierce your heart. Father, we thank you for this beautiful picture of your presence being carried in human form. We thank you for Mary, the mother of Jesus, and her testimony. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to your word. And I pray that this truth would resonate deep inside of us and that we would also, in our own little way, continue to give birth to God's life, to your life inside of us. Holy Spirit, we invite you there. And I pray for a willingness to walk the path you have chosen for us. Turning our backs to the world and all of its, its temptations and its lusts and its things. And taking up the cross daily to follow you. Going into the ground as a seed. Dying there and letting your life shoot forth. We bless you for this picture. And we worship you and may your truth impact us for eternity. I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. I will turn it over to, I think, Joe probably.